Welcome to Marketing Mistakes and How to Avoid Them. I'm Stacey Jones, the founder of Influencer Marketing and Branded Content Agency, Hollywood Branded. This podcast provides brand marketers a learning platform for top experts to share their insights and knowledge on topics which make a direct impact on your business today. While it is impossible to be well-versed on every topic and strategy that can improve bottom line results, my goal is to help you avoid making costly mistakes of time, energy, or money, whether you are doing a DIY approach or hiring an expert to help. Let's begin today's discussion. Welcome to Marketing Mistakes and How to Avoid Them. Here's your host, Stacy Jones. Welcome to Marketing Mistakes and How to Avoid Them. I'm Stacy Jones, and I'm so happy to be here with you all today. And I want to give a very warm welcome to Margarita Monet. Margarita is the founder of rock band Edge of Paradise and is a triple threat of a singer, songwriter, and pianist. After moving to LA back in 2011 and writing songs, she met Dave Bates and formed their band Edge of Paradise, which has released three charting records, over 10 music videos, and has toured over 40 states, Japan and Europe. The band's third studio album, called Universe, was released on November 8th by Frontier Records and has over 5 million streams already. Today, Margarita will be speaking about her experience as a musician and how marketing and social media have been important tools to drive the band's success, lessons that apply to brands of any type. We'll learn what works from her perspective, what should be avoided, and how some just miss the mark. Margarita, welcome. So happy to have you here with us today. Thank you so much for the introduction. It's my pleasure. Of course. So can you share with our listeners what got you to here today? I mean, obviously, you have a love of music and performing, but what started you off on this journey and resulted in your having a successful band? Uh, well, definitely love for music, um, a lot of hard work and perseverance <laughs> because it's a definitely a tough market. And these days you really have to uh, be not only a musician, you have to be a business person, you have to be a market person, marketer. You also have to learn what visually people are attracted to as well um, and you know make the visual aspect of the band complement the sonic aspect so everything works together because you have to engage people on all senses <laughs> all right. so um, I mean we definitely went through a lot of hurdles and made a ton of mistakes and but you know everything that we've gone through brought us here and in a way shaped us into better songwriters because everything that you go through really um, you know makes you grow as a person on you know um, across all aspects. So. Now you're a classically trained pianist right that's how you started I'm assuming when you were a little girl um, I'm, I'm making lots of assumptions here. <laughs> no you're right I started when I was like four in, in Russia <laughs> I practiced five hours a day and um, it definitely really helps me in what I do but in a lot of ways I think the best is to really learn as much as you can and then when you're creating something of your own forget everything and just use that as a tool because you really have to kind of follow your imagination and your passion and try not to follow trends because in these days it's so easy to just try to chase after what's popular but what's popular today may not be popular tomorrow so I think it's really important to really stay true to what you create and you know make it as great as you can and then people will follow because you really believe in it so I think that belief in what you do and that um uh, you know, uh, it really takes a lot of work to make that the best it can be, because I think that's really important to make what whatever you make the best it can be. And, um, and then it will fall into place. Now, when you are all the way back to four and then into your tween and teenage years, did you want to be in a band? Is that what you thought you would be doing? No, I would I never imagine that I would be in a band. It was so, I mean, maybe secretly I wanted to. I remember my parents had like old VHS tapes of Led Zeppelin and Queen um, live concerts. Mm -hmm. And to me, it just seemed like another dimension, like it did not even come close. I could be doing something remotely close to that. Um, so my life kind of happened by chance. A lot of things, um, um, a lot of things made the other things happen, mm -hmm. um, if that makes sense. It was kind of like a domino effect. <laughs> 
<laughs> and I just kind of followed it and it led me here. But what I did was I did really work hard at everything I did. And um, I really also approached it with kind of a business aspect and a, um, like a marketing um, mindset. Mm -hmm. And I, I come from also a theater background. So I love art and theater and um, I really tried to bring that into the music and create a world for people to that, you know, for them to want to be a part of it. So they not just have music, they also have all the visual aspect of it. Okay, that's awesome. And then so you came out, you are creating songs, you meet someone and you decide you all are going to start a band. <laughs> yeah, well, pretty much when I met Dave, he actually already had a band with Robin McCauley and then Robin went on tour with Survivor and the Rob so Dave was kind of um it, not less yeah he wanted he wanted to have someone that kind of took the project all the way dedicated everything to the band because these days to be there's so much out there you really need to dedicate all your time and effort into something to your business or into something you want to grow so that's where me and him really lined up because our music backgrounds were very different but our passion aligned so uh, we figured out and then, then it kind of worked because he brings that heavy metal um, guitars and that background and I bring more of like the theater classical like cinematic stuff and we you know it took us years and years but I think finally we really um found the sound that defines us and it's kind of unique and interesting and uh, we just what really uh, i guess kept us going is that drive and passion for what we do so okay and so here you are you have a band yeah how do you make sure that you actually get fans for your band who are going to listen to you who are actually going to come to concerts who are going to attend the venues you're booking because the venues aren't going to care about booking you again unless people actually show up. So yeah. marketing is actually incredibly important to you. Incredibly important. And we made a ton of mistakes. And when we just started, so Dave had a car, he had a, a 67 Chevelle and he sold it. And we had like a stack of, we had like 20 grand. So like, we're gonna invest this into this band. So we used 10 grand to make the first album and the other 10 grand we just handed to a publicist. Mm -hmm. And you know, we had some idea, but we were like really new to everything. Um, so, you know, the publicist did his thing and it did, it did some good things, but uh, it didn't really get us anywhere. <laughs> so, okay. You know, you... you a lot of people tend to think that you have to throw money right away, but you, you do have to throw money, but you have to be really careful on how you spend it and you have to have a product. So, um, you know, after, I guess, you know, we made the album, we toured a lot. Mm -hmm. um, I started to really thinking how to package the band in a way that it's not just music, you know, obviously we had to keep evolving our music and making the music better and better and better. I had to make sure we bring the visual aspect of it to create that experience. I think these days, what's important is to have the experience for people so they could um, just kind of take them out of this reality, not even take them out of this reality. That's more for us, but like in general aspect, you really need to trigger people's attention in many different ways. So, um, you know, it's coming from music videos to photos, to how you present the photo, how you edit it, how you, uh, you know, it has to be coherent. Everything has to have a story. And then once you have that, you have to learn what works the best for you online. And when we started, Instagram wasn't even that popular. It was all right. about Facebook. So we kind of built our fan base on Facebook. And then Facebook started introducing the ads. Everything changes so quickly. So, you know, we learned that it's important to have great imagery with the message you're trying to send. Um, and that translated into Instagram. 
uh, to be with every post, you have to be very like not mention a lot of things at once. I think it's really important that you have a clear message with each post and um, be like frequent and coherent with it. So I noticed a lot of people write a lot of long posts and right. the message get, gets lost and people these days don't have a lot of patience so they just keep scrolling. So for us, what worked is just to have something visually stunning and very clear messaging and always have always have like a call to action in a way, whether it is to, you know, watch the video or listen to the song or ask people for their input or ask, you know, what what's their favorite lyric or what's their favorite song, you know, something along those lines just be very clear in what you want people to get from the post and uh, you know later on like these days you have a lot of tools like promoting the mm -hmm. ad so when you do promote you have to be very clear on the audience you select and you have a great tool with Facebook and Instagram where they give you like the bands that you sound similar to or like the areas or demographics. So you really have to be smart on how you're spending your money in that regard. Yeah, and so, you know, I know you have your own personal um, social um, pages. Now, does your band also have your own social pages? Are you keeping them separate and, and how you're focused and growing? I mean, for me, um, like everything right now is on the focus on the band page and uh, like because I handle a lot of the social media so for me it gets a little bit difficult so I don't tend to post as much on my own profile. It takes a lot of time. It's, it's an about, amazing amount of time. Yeah so I try to gear everybody towards the band Instagram and Facebook and Twitter and then you have Spotify. I mean we're lucky like we have built enough so now we have a great team of people we have label in us we have your label in italy and the us label um so it's howard benson's label and neil from three days grace so they have grady benson who is great with marketing on social media and he really understands algorithms algorithms <laughs> so for um you know he brings great advice and, but, you know, um, I'm still in kind of charge of all the creative aspect of it. Um, and then now we have TikTok, which I've been very resistant to, <laughs> but unfortunately that's where, you know, a lot of people are. And, you know, to be honest, like when you just go on TikTok and it's that for you section, you kind of get horrified by everything <laughs> that comes your way. Um, so I think it's important to, not get overwhelmed by the type of content that's out there and really stick to your brand and what you're trying to create and find your niche within the platform. And so with your platform and as a band and I'm looking at the image from you behind that you were performing at, there's a lot of older faces in that audience, right? Mm -hmm. And yet you're saying, you know, we need to consider TikTok. <laughs> is that so that you can reach a younger audience or do you have that younger audience already or is it that you're trying to get into a younger audience yeah it's a, it's a little bit of all those things like the the picture in the back we were on tour with sonata arctica and they're european band and they've been around for almost 25 to 30 years they have people who have been in their 20s who are now 25 30 years in yeah exactly <laughs> Yeah, so, you know, we were actually a bit nervous how they would take to a younger band because we yeah. do sound a little bit more modern. Mm -hmm. And, um, but, you know, we try to build audience in all aspects because rock fans are very dedicated and loyal. And if they like your music, they will like your music for the rest of your career and, you know, the rest of their life. So that's what's so cool about, you know, rock music. Mm -hmm. um, but you know, now like with streaming, what I've noticed, streaming is definitely more of a younger audience. So um, when we try to reach younger fans, we go on Spotify, we do go on Instagram, we go on you know, TikTok, we're just kind of starting to get into that. But you know, YouTube, Spotify, that's all um, very much younger audience as well. 
And, you know, for the older audience, I really try to make sure we have great packaging for like the physical products mm -hmm. because they still love vinyls, they still love CDs. And I really love all that. So we take a lot of time to put into, you know, the booklets and the artwork and just, you know, so they have something that can, you know, stand the test of time that's not just in the cloud somewhere. So, so yeah, you have very different demographics. You have, you know, the younger demographic who's going after uh, NFTs, right? Non fungible yeah. tokens, like, that. That. like digital assets. They're like, I'm going to pay money for something that no one else has because it's a digital drawing of this. Mm -hmm. And then you have the older demographic who's like, what the, what is an NFT? <laughs> I want a good old sh shirt. I want a good old album I want something to walk away with and the booklets that you're talking about and everything like that that's two very different ways of having to market yeah it's and the nft thing you know you have that part half of people thinking it's like the next big thing and half people thinking it's a scam because they or know what it is they're like I don't understand what it even is is it fungus it's a digital thing <laughs> I know, you can take a screenshot and then it's like who knows what's the original right uh, so it, it Kind of gets blurry um so yeah it, the world is definitely always changing and you know my, our motto is just to kind of stick to um evolving our sound and to be open to these changes and kind of um you know create our niche within those changes yeah. because you know we could be resistant and just be like oh i hate that and i hate that and you know sometimes we do feel that way but you know from a business and marketing standpoint and just from the standpoint that you want your music to reach people, it's important to be really aware of what's going on around you. So for any of our listeners who they have their own band and they're like, all I need is a label. What I'm hearing from you say is that's nice, but you're going to still have to market yourself. Oh yeah. Yeah. I don't think people <laughs> realize that uh, when you do have a label, everything just gets amplified because you have that pressure. It's not just you now, other people are not relying, but they're expecting you to, you know, do your thing. So now you do have support, but everything is so much amplified that you find yourself doing even more and trying to figure out how to handle that. But, you know, you, you do have more tools and, you know, maybe more doors are kind of opening up. It's just, you know, it's not like, a, oh, I, you know, I get a label and I'm all set. It's the opposite. <laughs> <laughs> the work just begins. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. It's like taking any small business and then getting investors. Because exactly. that's really what it is. A label's investing in you as a music artist. And they're putting their people and their money and their power behind you. Just like they would if you have a small business and now you have an investor group come in. But unlike many investors, they're not silent investors. They actually want to have an active voice in what the future is of how you're doing and what you're building. Yeah, you're exactly on point though. <laughs> yeah, that's exactly right. And, you know, there is money involved. So when people invest money, they expect the money to make returns. Mm -hmm. So that's another aspect where you have to be kind of smart because like what, you know, we have a lot of trouble with shipping and um, like we, we sell a lot of merchandise, but shipping is so expensive these days that the returns are not very much. So that's why everything is transitioning into digital. People are just getting so fed up with spending so much making the product and, you know, spending a lot on shipping it. And, you know, it's kind of sad because I still love physical products. And I think, you know, you have to have both. So you have to be smart on how, you know, like what products you make. So it doesn't take you so much money to ship. Uh, so, yeah, you just kind of have to really think ahead and be smart about everything you do. So I would assume that when you have products that need shipping, it's probably better at this point of selling those things at a live venue where you're going to have more people who want to buy and walk away. And then you focus on your digital assets when you're looking at engaging people and building your brand. Yeah, yeah, you're exactly right. Before this whole new world started, <laughs> before the pandemic, when we released our album Universe, we did a big pre-order and we were doing it right before going on tour. So we did put in the option, um, you know, pick it up at the show. 
and mm-hmm. you know it urges people to go to the show it urges people to um you know buy merch because you know we have to pick it up from the artist and it's signed and you get that experience like I love meeting fans and it's such a cool thing that they you know they want something of yours and they're part of you know they love your music and then you get that personal trend you know personal interaction which you know we're all missing right now um but yeah when you know when you do trying to promote something yeah definitely focus on digital and you know when you do have shows um yeah you can have more of like that physical uh products but you know we have to have both these days it's just (laughs) do you end up selling the merch for people to have at at your show beforehand so is it a pre-order that you're selling you have their credit card information it's locked and they have to show up like, and is it so you know before the show how many units you've sold already and how long you're going to actually have to stand there signing stuff? Yeah, for like for this tour, we did know a lot of that because mm-hmm. when we called it pre I mean, some, some people selected shipping if we didn't go to their city, but a lot of people have selected to pick, pick it up at the show. So we had to like, I remember before the show, I was like, oh my God, is this package ready? <laughs> is this ready? <laughs> to make sure we have everything, all the sizes are correct, you know? Um, so it takes a lot of preparation, but yeah, we did know ahead of time. Um, so yeah, and they came and they picked it up and we met them and it was pretty awesome. Uh, you know, but like right now, you know, we have to ship it because yeah, we're locked down. There's not a lot of options there. No. (laughs) Are there any things along the way that you tried with marketing that just did not work at all that you're like, oh, I, that was a good learning lesson. Yeah, we, uh, well, you know, when picking publicists, we wasted a lot of money going after like really big websites. And it takes a lot of, you know, cause like you, you can have like an ad in Rolling Stone magazine. You can have an interview in Rolling Stone. I don't know. You can go on, you know, the late show or <laughs> like you can do a lot if you have a lot of money, but and I've seen like we did a lot of we did some of that that we shouldn't have spent but I witnessed a lot of bands spending 50 grand 100 grand like if they have the money they spend it but it doesn't do anything so you have Mm -hmm. to really make sure you have um, either the product or the tour or the right thing to promote and to the right audience Mm -hmm. because you also have to keep in mind what audience that particular magazine has or even that tour you know a lot of bands they spend a lot of money on the tour and the audience is just not right for them and you know they don't gain anything from that so um i think for us a big lesson was to put the product ahead of um you know put the product first get really um you know, make great music, make great video and have a tour to support it and then go to marketing. I mean, I'm talking about like marketing, you know, a whole album. Sure. Every day, um, you know, you still have to make sure every day you get, you know, you reach new people. So that's where you go with, for us, it's just kind of Instagram, Facebook ads. Mm -hmm. But, you know, to think on a bigger scale, um, really have the product to back it and go to the, place where you have you're sure that's the right audience for you right and then you get the surprise of tiktok yeah (laughs) exactly where not only can you make content and be an artist featured but then you have to try to figure out how do you get your song to be featured potentially within other people's content so it's it's a double sword there and a double edge of things that you have to do Yeah, and actually we're crossing that bridge right now. And we do, like our label is kind of looking into it more, which um, is great for me because it's so new. Not that it's so new, but like I'm focused on other things and there's only so many hours in the day. So yeah, it's important. Uh, What a lot of artists don't realize is that what TikTok has is only 30 seconds of your song. And you actually have control of that 30 seconds that people hear. So it's really important that you you know that that 30 seconds would be best for someone to make that video, that it's like the most 
um, compelling part of the song. Because for example, if you have like a, an intro or you know something that wouldn't resonate with people because it's only 30 seconds, you can only get so much from that. Um, then you know you wouldn't get as much of a return as you could have. So just make sure you go to your distributor and that you select the best 30 seconds that you think people would want to make videos to. Which is probably very often the chorus, I'm assuming. Yeah, very often the chorus or or even like part of the verse that you would think someone would make like a, something clever to it. That right. You, cool words or yeah every song is different but yeah mostly be the chorus but you know I just really be creative in how you you know approach this any other thoughts on what our listeners should know about music marketing as a band <laughs> that um it's a pain <laughs> <Sometimes>. <laughs> Most things to market are a pain, quite honestly, and it's nothing is ever in any field anywhere under the sun, like any of our listeners listening in right now who aren't bands and how most of them are of that, but they're listening in and they're like, oh, well, music's different than what I'm doing. It's not. No. Everything has the exact things. You're talking about going to a publicist to have them help you. You know, brands are talking about going to a PR agency to have them help the number of stories I've heard of, oh, I hired a really expensive PR agency and it did nothing for me. And it just wasn't the right tactic, right? Or the right approach. So all of it is kind of a pain because it would be lovely if we could all create this great brand or this great song or whatever it might be and just have it magically be out in the universe for everyone to find and that they actually find it. It's the marketing part that's the make it or break it because you can have something that's an unbelievable gem but if no one knows about it, it kind of ends up not having had its life. Exactly. And, you know, on, along those lines, I think my best advice would be to start small, like really find your niche and then grow from there. Because mm -hmm. here's another thing that I remember happened to us. We had a radio campaign and you have like, you know, you have the rock radio and then you have like college station radio. The rock radio obviously co costs like, you know, tens of thousands of dollars um but you know it's not really going to do you a, a whole lot unless people kind of already know about you so start small and start you know go to like a local radio station go to like um you know go to like a local newspaper or a magazine or like you know website that's not you know aol or yahoo or something mm -hmm. and then kind of start learning mm -hmm on what tactics work best for you. And then you can go bigger from there because you really have to know what works for you before you start spending a lot of money and you know trying to go after big, bigger things. Well, and that's what's so great about Facebook and Instagram is because you can test campaigns that are $10 campaigns and yeah, see exactly. what you're getting from that and who you're reaching and really dial it in before you go out and you go big. Yeah, and then you learn your audience, you learn your demographics, which is also yeah. very useful. <laughs> And it can be surprising sometimes too. Yeah, very, exactly. Yeah. I've been very surprised by what people are like, oh, she sounds like that. I would have never thought, but, uh, and then, you know, sometimes you would think that those type of uh, people that like that music would never like us, but you'd be surprised. So when you test different things, you know, go a little bit of your comfort outside of your comfort zone and, you know, you, you might be surprised and make notes. <laughs> Well, how can our listeners learn more about you? Where should they go to find out all about your music now that, you know, they're, they're, they have to be curious? <laughs> well, they can go on our website, which is edgeofparadiseband.com. And they can also go on our YouTube, which if they just search Edge of Paradise, our music videos will come up on Spotify, Edge of Paradise. On Instagram, Edge of Paradise, pretty much anywhere, just type Edge of Paradise and you will find us. And we are very social bands, so we love to interact with people and, uh, you know, grow our community. So, you know, we would love to hear from you. Perfect. Well, thank you, Margarita. Thank you so much for joining us today. You know, this was a definitely a different interview and a different angle, but everything you said, and, and for our listeners, just again, I just want to reiterate this. There is no difference between any type of product pretty much under the sun, B2B, B2C, music, 
anything. And it's the same challenges with marketing and advertising. And it's the same approaches that can be used. You just have to decide, as Margarita was so good about saying, is it a localized effort? Is it a national effort? Is it a global effort? And you can really hone in on those smaller audiences and learn about your brand and grow from there before you start spending tens, hundreds, millions of dollars. <laughs> exactly. Well, thank you so much. It was such a pleasure. And um, yeah, really great to be here. I appreciate it. Awesome. Well, you were great to be here. Thanks. Thank you again. Thank you. And then to our listeners, thank you for tuning in to another episode of Marketing Mistakes and How to Avoid Them. I look forward to chatting with you this next week. Have a great day.